Hello, I'm Claudia Ives and I was born Claudia McNulty. So how did you come to know Lee and Ronan's and get, come to Farley's? Um, so my mother and Lee were, I think it's accepted on both sides of the family, were best friends and became best friends very quickly. They met quite late in life. Um, Lee and my mother, Bettina, and both the chaps, Roland and my father, also got on really, really well. But I, would, I think they would both say that they were each other's best friends. Uh, for example, when Lee won the um, smorgasbord Norwegian open face sandwich competition, her prize was to go to Norway and she took and she took my mother so, and, and they had an absolute blast. So Lee and Roland were very much part of my life from for as long as I can remember. When you think of Lee at Farley's, what's the first kind of thought that comes about her? I see her either in her kitchen or later in her cookbook room. Yeah. Um, a lot in the kitchen. But I see her at the ki at the table, probably with my, well, definitely with my mother, and the two of them chopping, laughing, catching up on the week. Because we'd arrive on a Friday evening. Patsy would pick us up from Lewis Station, and Lee would be in the middle of prepping supper, and then we'd just all fall in. And But Lee's sitting at the kitchen table, just... Full of conversation, full of delight, hatching plans for the weekend, lots of laughter. Roland, Roland was really, really friendly and a great friend to my parents, but slightly scary for me. Why was he scary? I'm not scary, that's the wrong word. Intimidating. Slightly intimidating. When he was in the artist mode. Um, working in a kind of do not disturb me way uh, in his um, converted Barney thing right at the bottom of the garden. And finding that space quite exciting because I knew that, you know, proper projects were going on there. He was a proper, proper artist. And what wasn't intimidating at all was when we went on the walks. So going to meet the cows. And I loved his affinity with the cows. So I'd find that, I'd find it quite exciting that he was this, you know, world known um, artist. And yet, he was also a farmer who really liked his cows. I like that side of him. So you get home from school on Friday, you're living in London, and your mum and dad say, we're going to Farley's. You said, you call it Farley's or Farley Farley's, Farley? yep. For the weekend, what was your reaction? Fantastic, best weekend of the month. <laughs> I mean, all the other weekends weren't fun too, but, but no, really, I really did love going down there. There was never that sense of, okay, time to go to bed, dear. It was just not like that. Nor were you forced to stay at table. You know, I, I wanted to be at table. There was no kind of, you can't get down. I never felt watched or judged. Um, I never felt spied on. I never felt that I couldn't just do my own thing. And from really quite a young age down there, I would be on my own quite a lot. Mm which I really enjoyed. And I would go to the barn and I would climb the haystacks and I'd find rats and, um, you know, kind of get a bit mucky and maybe get a bit hurt sometimes, fall off things and whatever. And there was never, there was never any sucking of teeth or anything like that. It was just part of what happened. The other incredible thing that was fantastically generous of both Roland and Lee was that they then, as I got older, often asked me to bring friends. So from 11 onwards, I would pretty much always bring a friend for the weekend. That's very sweet. Which is it's incredible, nice and thoughtful, incredible isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, to just bring an unknown child into your house for the weekend who might turn out to be a disaster. And some came repeatedly and became really, you know, part of it. You know, the Christmases were just so spectacular and just the happiest, most extraordinary memories. Um, and with the enormous Christmas tree, and by enormous, I mean sort of practically. Trafalgar Square yeah, kind they of were like Norwegian eight or nine Christmas tree. Foot, weren't they? They um, were like right oh, up to much the much taller. Because you spent met quite a few Christmases at Farley's, yeah. right? Was it like what, was it every year or was it for about I would say five it was or six alternate, years? As a complete guess, I would say alternate years. So you <laughs> talk me talk me through the sequence, the Christmas sequence at of Farley's. What you remember of it? So mm -hmm. the most spectacular for me was the bell ringers coming, and the bell ringers from the village. All these chaps would come who were, I presume, local farmers. And they would, they would come up um, into the old kitchen at Farley's and ring their bells for Christmas carols. 
and it was completely mesmerizing. And I just never heard anything like it, never even heard of it other than there. I think I was just so mesmerized by watching these chaps ringing these huge bells. And then there'd be one at the end who only had one. It with the little tiny ones. And the little so. tiny ones. Is it? There'd be one guy with a really big one they'd have to kind of do, I guess, with two hands or something. And then there'd be the ones that were much busier. And then there'd be the kind of guy at the end who was a bit bored who only, you know, got the old dong. And it was just completely absorbing. I loved that. That was such a fantastic start to Christmas. The, the bell ringing parties, were there how many people were there? Because I found a, a list which had like yeah, 60 chicken vol au vent, 60 prawn cocktail, whatever, vol au vent. And then there's this like whole list and it's a lot of food that she's kind of preparing. As a complete guess, and other people would probably remember better because I was that young, but my, my guess would be 60. Yeah, and the whole place was just buzzing with people and it was really, really good fun. And then there was one year where I was starting not to believe in Santa Claus anymore, Father Christmas, and Roland was suitably horrified and he said well I can prove to you that he exists and he must have known that it was a night of shooting stars <clears throat> and so he took me outside and he said within a couple of seconds we're going to see um, Santa's sleigh uh, in the sky and so he takes me outside and Santa's sleigh promptly on cue goes darting across the sky no way that's so cool so that was I was back on board for another year <laughs> <laughs> with that one what was your, what's your favourite rim at Farley's? Ooh, that's a lovely question. Um, oh gosh, so many. Because the old kitchen definitely at Christmas. Mm -hmm. I did love the drawing room. Like the sitting, sitting room. room, yeah. yeah. Um, why, did you, why did you love it? So? Like the colours. The colours and the, and the art kind of in, intermingled with being a comfortable space to be in relatively formal but in a kind of tatty way I quite like the fact the sofas were almost always at their kind of end of springiness and um, you know cushions were always kind of you know, nobody went around plumping up cushions and doing anything fancy like that everything was just kind of schlumpy and the colours the colours at Farley were fantastic that fantastic yellow at Farley and the fantastic blue yeah. is so vibrant and makes me think of Egypt and holiday and, and I love that there's a staircase that you will know in at Farley's and up the side of the staircase is a wooden slide as I saw it the same yeah, angle I know it's, really, it's, like the, a, it's like a plank it's like a plank yeah. and from about the age of four I thought I've got to give this a go this is fantastic this is clearly yeah. clearly <laughs> a fantastic slide but not being particularly good at science I hadn't worked out that because there was actually a vertical wall at the end of yes. this I was actually going to hit the wall with my feet at tremendously high speed because it's a highly polished piece of wood and I was going to flip around the wall and cut half my ear off. Um, Out. And so Patsy comes to the rescue and she nabs me and she takes me up to Roland's office and she plonks me down and she's wrapping up my ear and doing all sorts of things and she gets these great big scissors to cut the bandages and she drops the scissors on her toe and lops some of her toe off. No. So we end, both ended up going to hospital, so that was quite exciting. Oh my god! <laughs> but again, it was, it was something that was seen as funny. It was, I, don't, I don't mean, oh, everything was funny, ha ha, weren't they all so clever because they thought that things that were actually serious were funny. But there was no kind of, <gasps> you know, there, there was no catastrophizing, there was no or drama, blaming or, or nothing yeah. like that. But there was, it was just funny. Okay. It was funny and fun and, um, and my ear grew back. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm so glad. No, I can see you I... have two ears. <laughs> There were two tops of the house. One was where Patsy and, and Georgie's room was. And then up another staircase, right at the top of the house, were two bedrooms, one of which was Valentine's and one of which was ours and presumably every other, every other guest that stayed the weekend. But because we were there so often, it felt like it was ours. Yeah, that's the one that Picasso stayed in and as well. Picasso stayed in as well. <laughs> so good company. What was so amazing, sorry, I've, I've sidetracking myself. What was so extraordinary was that Valentine was still great friends with Roland, even though they were divorced. divorced. Yeah. And that Lee accepted Valentine into her house, this ex-wife, and she stayed in this room up at the top of the house and they were friends and Lee fed her and, and nurtured her and anyway, you know, that's, I think that says, it's this speaks volumes. It's lovely, isn't it? Speaks it? Volumes, they, they isn't were, it? They were such close. It's amazing, yeah. it's amazing. So Valentine was that much older than Lee and was getting a little bit dosh, dotty and dithery and um, so Lee and my mother concocted this plan that I would dress up as a young Victorian girl and I would come in with my Victorian dress on 
and Spent. rolling a um, hula hoop. And I had to roll that in. And poor woman, I think she'd just woken up from a nap or something. And then I was sent in. And I don't know whether I was supposed to give her the fright of her life or whether it was supposed to be funny or what. But I don't actually remember the... The result, I just remember being kind of horrified that I was supposed to do that. Anyway, they thought it was hilariously funny. And, uh, and in I go, rolling this hoop, and this poor, this poor woman, who presumably by then was 88 or something, I don't know, she certainly seemed it, wakes up and you know, sees this young girl from her childhood coming in to her bedroom. Very, anyway, they were always up to, they were so naughty, they were always up to <laughs> so tricks and crazy things. Do you, do you remember any particular guests you know some nights there'd be stan the man fred the gardener uh john the greengrocer um you know and possibly two or three other chaps quite chappy centric and then lee and my mother and my dad and roland and the kitchen was just you know stan arriving in the evenings was always kind of you know an energy boost and then um why, why was he an energy oh, boost? oh just because it was just a different person and he was t so different to anyone that i knew in the rest of my life yeah. And then, of course, there was the nightly arrival of Greengrocer. John Robbie. John Robbie. Yeah. So he would arrive with the food for the day, and that would be another social interaction. So that would be 20 minutes. He used to always whistle as he was coming in. Yes, yes. And I remember asking him, I said, why do you always whistle when you're coming in? He goes, because in the early days, I used to not whistle, and I used to walk in on people doing funny things. Brilliant. I love it. So I learned to whistle very early on. And then and he'd kind of come on in. And then he'd stand whiskey. around. So then by that stage, if there was Stan there, then Fred the gardener would have finished. Everyone worked so late. Yeah, I mean, no one knocked off at four and went home because they kind of wanted to be there, I guess. I don't know, yeah. I hope. And what was so great was that on the weekends, there'd be Cyril Connolly or Sonia Orwell or... Um, Professor Sir Freddie Eyre or something, yeah. and it it the conversation was always equally interesting. Oh God, they were so accepting of a young girl, young child. You know, there was no. It's really strange to. Th I hadn't really thought about this until today, um, that I wasn't made to feel like a child. I don't know if I told you before, but I had this perfect list, and on it were only two people. And the reason I think Lee wasn't on the perfect list. <laughs> Um, this is so typically kind of whatever age I was. I might have been, I hope, actually, now that I say it, I hope I was more like eight. <laughs> yeah, the reason she wasn't on my perfect list was that she used to tap her nails. Tap? I used to tap her nails on the kitchen table. She's driving me mad. She's always? No, just if she was talking sometimes, always, you know, she'd kind of think, so I think, I'm thinking that maybe we'll cook, you know, whatever, uh, green eggs and ham or something. Um, and then she'd be tapping her nails. So it's a really deep and meaningful reason for her not to be on my playlist. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd yeah. strike someone yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever do, like, kind of girl rituals with her, like, nails and she, stuff? No, she wasn't at all vain. And she wasn't at all into other girls or women thinking about how they looked either. And she never kind of talked about fashion or never. clothes? Or... I, I would never have guessed that she'd been in fashion. But and it was she mostly in me. their kind of like sloppy clothes, yeah. like the, that little jacket, waistcoat thing, very and, and cords, baggy cords. And... Uh, the cords in the in the winter and then in the summer. I do remember there was a lot of bottom half of leg showing, and there was quite a bit of sock and sandal going on. Oh no! Oh, oh yeah. no! That's terrible. And I did <laughs> mention that to Kate when she was asking about. Leave for the film. Yeah. And I said, if you do do any, any kind of summer scenes, you, you, you have to wear socks and sandals. Maybe yeah. that's why they set it in the winter. <laughs> oh, is it, all, is it all in the winter? I haven't seen it yet. But um, <laughs> maybe. Because it wouldn't have been right to have her in a summer outfit without the socks and sandals. Ouch. And how did she relate to you? Mm. It's an interesting question. I don't understand why she felt connected to me. I understand why I felt connected to her because she was a genuinely vibrant, interesting person, but I was, frankly, quite a dull 10 or whatever year old, you know. But she was always fantastically lovely to me. What kind of things did you chat about? Oh, it makes me feel slightly tearful, actually. Um, 
She kind of asked me about how things were going at school, and mostly they weren't going great, because I didn't really like school that much. Um, so, you know, she'd ask me why things weren't going well and kind of make me feel better about it somehow. She once said to me, um, if you ever get into any kind of trouble, and by which she meant getting pregnant, mm. if you feel you don't want to talk to your mother, I hope that you'll come to me. Oh. Which is a very... I mean, it's probably now a very normal thing to say, maybe for close friends. It feels like quite a modern thing to say, but I think at the time it wasn't. No. It wasn't normal. It just kind of showed a lot of understanding it did. as well, really. It did. Um, and did I, you feel like you could have? I did. I did. Yeah. And you said to me you'd, you really dislike it when people call her an alcoholic. I, I remember her with a glass in her hand. I remember her drinking, but I definitely do not have any memory of her being an alcoholic. And it does upset me when that is one of the two or three things that are used to describe her. You know, she was a, a war a model, a beautiful model, man raised muse, a war correspondent, and later a very adventurous cook. And an alcoholic. Now, I'm sorry, that is not one of her five features, one of her five characteristics in my book. You know, as a young child, if she had been like that, I would have been scared of her. Mm. And I wasn't. At all, ever. And do you do you remember when my, they heard that my mum and dad had got married? Because that was quite a big thing, wasn't it? Oh my God! Yeah, that was amazingly exciting. And your mum was so adored by Lee and Roland. Um, and when and when your dad and mum came back from their big trip and everything, it was just. It was so exciting, and then you know there was a new person on the scene, and blah blah blah, and everyone has to meet Susanna. Oh yeah, yeah, that was very exciting. We found a whole stash of letters that Lee wrote to my dad while he was travelling around the world, and it's it feels like she's really trying to make an effort, but by that time, for him, it's too yeah, late. He's pulled away. He's already pulled away, but she's talking very much about. She's talk about how they've planted two trees outside her study and she thinks of them as being him and my mum because they're leaning towards each oh, other slightly so um just really sweet see i have a theory about lee and your dad uh, that's not to excuse her but but that had she been able to kind of catapult herself to him being 12 yeah it would have been fine but by that stage the damage is done we found also we found and this is only like a few weeks ago, we found a letter that we hadn't archived properly. And in it, she actually says that she thank, feels that she has um, postnatal yeah. depression. Yeah, totally. Maybe it would have been easier if she, if she if it was a girl, because maybe there were connections with the war. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. But I really do agree with you. I think that their relationship, if you just take out those first 10 years or so, would have been very different. Yeah. Or, or if she hadn't had all of that mental health issues yeah. to deal with, then she might have been able to be the mum that she wanted to be, yeah. or that she tried to be later in life. Yeah. What, does, what does Lee Miller mean to you? Um, Lee was a big figure in my life. Uh, she wasn't maternal. She wasn't like a sort of second mother or anything, but she was like a, like a godmother kind of figure to me. And I found her very inspiring. Ooh, I just thought of something. So my husband and I got married at Farley's, and a uh, long time after Lee had died. And we went on honeymoon to Italy, and my husband and I took this flat bottom boat out way further than probably you should take that kind of boat. And we got to this rocky island and totally black water, completely scary, middle of the sea, miles from any other human beings. And we sit on this boat and I look into the water and I looked at him and I said, Earth, can we go swimming in that with nobody around and no anchor and uh, I can't just swim in the middle of the black sea with you know and I suddenly felt, felt really frightened and he's not a swimmer at all so he said if you're not doing it I'm definitely not doing it so we sat on this <laughs> boat thinking this is crazy this is our honeymoon we're here we've driven out to this to this amazing fantastically beautiful spot and now we're just going to sit here and do what play Scrabble all afternoon and so um, I suddenly thought to myself what would Lee do Lee would jump in I don't even know if Lee swims, but um, she but does. She does. Yeah. Um, but uh, and Lee would jump in, and I just jumped in, and she just completely inspired me. I just thought Lee would not stop. She was a doer. She was a um, she was a yes person, and 
she wasn't going to be put off by a bit of, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea of darkness. She'd just jump in. So I jumped in. And he jumped in and we went there every day, said afterwards. <laughs>